perspective on the history of computing uh, that we don't usually talk about. And that is, each great advance in computing has brought computers closer to human speech. Uh, the very first computers were literally hardwired circuits. And then we got to uh, basically machine language. The first programmers are, are flicking switches, putting in binary word by binary word a program into the computer. And then we start to get uh, you know, somewhat higher level language with we can write assembly language. You just move data to this register, take it from here, put it there, do these operations on it, which were very close to the language of the machine. Only a small number of people could do it. And then you start to get higher level languages. And of course, computers in the early days were big uh, monolithic devices that very few people had access to. And then you have a breakthrough with the personal computer. And it wasn't just that personal computers became commonplace. It's that they also started to have much easier programming language, such that hobbyists and individuals could start to imagine, hey, I can use this thing. So it was a democratization. It, it, it was coming closer to human speech. And then we, we see a revolution like the graphical user interface, which again made it possible for even more people to use computers because you didn't have to learn any arcane language. You could just start you know, pointing and clicking. In a way, the computer code was dominant. You know, somebody wrote a program that had little bits of human communication embedded in it. You know, you think about, say, in Microsoft Word, there are menus that have human language in it, but most of it's just this interface that's been written by a programmer. And then suddenly you get this breakthrough with the World Wide Web, and they've inver it's inverted the paradigm. Instead, you have human language is the interface, you know, written language, to be sure, and images, and that calls individual programs. So again, it's coming closer and closer to us. You have a bit of a sideways move from there with the graphical user interface on phones, uh, which has touch screens, and so we start to have more senses, but it's becoming easier and easier to use. More and more people are engaged. And guess what? This is the next big wave. For the first time, we really are starting to have computers have gotten smart enough that they're coming all the way towards us, where we can actually speak with them in our language, and they can understand it. So that's a profound shift. And, and I guess I would say with each of those expansions, you've had more people able to interact with computers, able to do more things. And I think we're just at the beginning of an astonishing new wave that really is bigger than any of the previous waves, just as each one that came along was bigger than what came before. You know, there were, wow, hundreds of millions of PCs, and everybody thought that was amazing. And then suddenly there were, you know, uh, billions of people on the internet. And that's the other thing, of course, all of these machines have become increasingly connected. And in a way, the story of computing is also the story of the development of a kind of hybrid. Now, that image that Peter opened with of walking on the trail, the woman and the robot, uh, is actually a perfect image because we are really talking about the partnership of human and machine. And many times when we think of AI, you know, we think of it as some kind of singular intelligence apart from us. And I like to suggest that AI is kind of a, a, a massive hybrid of human and machine. And again, this is another way of thinking about this progress. You used to have these individual machines, they became more and more connected. But more than that, they became connected not just as machines, but as devices for harnessing and harvesting the collective intelligence of all their users. If you think about what I called Web 2.0 back in 2004, it was really about you know, how the secret sauce of what came after the dot-com bust were the companies that harnessed collective intelligence. Google literally you know, taking all of this knowledge that was embodied in all the documents that humans were creating and then sucking it in this new way. Uh, things like Twitter made it real time. All of a sudden, this was happening faster and faster. In some sense, you could start to see the thoughts in a global brain. And now, this is the next stage there. Because again, look at these, these uh, large language models. They are taking all of human written text, 
and bringing it together. So they're, they're really an amalgam of human and machine. They're reflecting ourselves back to us. And of course, that's an important thing to realize. They're a mirror. They're a mirror of all that's good and bad in our society. And it's really important when we think about, oh, we're gonna fix the bias. You know, we don't wanna be fixing the mirror. We wanna be fixing what it is showing us. And, <laughs> and, uh, Which is us. You know, uh, anyway, so the basic thing here, I guess I would say is, we're in this moment of an intense explosion uh, into the next stage, uh, which is gonna be enormously larger than anything that's happened before. It is be, gonna bring people and machines together in new ways, and we're really only at the beginning. It will be very disruptive, but I think it's also incredibly empowering, and it will help us. Uh, there's a great quote from a guy named Paul Cohen, a professor at University of Pittsburgh, who once said, the opportunity of AI is to help humans model and manage complex interacting systems. If you look at the challenges of the world today, uh, climate change, economics, uh, these are challenges of, of coordination. And I like to think uh, uh, of a quote from Hal Varian, Google's uh, chief economist, who once said uh, you know, about, about robots, you know, if, we're, if, we're, if we're lucky, the robots will arrive just in time. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic.